Hitler's goal of a German master race controlling the world required space and plenty of Aryan DNA. Little wonder that he set his sights on the US. But how detailed were his plans, and were they already underway? History is very clear about Hitler's relentless march across Europe and his desire to rebuild under the flag of the Third Reich. But what about across the Atlantic? James P. Duffy, historian and author of Target America, Hitler's Plan to Attack the United States, says that's a little less clear and historians have long debated how much Hitler wanted. Duffy says that Hitler intended to rule the world. He cites a 1927 letter from Rudolf Hess to the London-based Nazi Walter Hevel, in which Hess wrote of Hitler preaching, "...world peace will be realizable only when one power, the racially best power, has attained complete and uncontested supremacy. That power can then provide a sort of world police." This seems to confirm there were plans for even America to fall under the jurisdiction of a global Nazi law enforcement agency. Hitler definitely had his eye on the US. Although the national interest calls the Nazi attempt to build a bomber that could cross the Atlantic an idiotic waste of resources, the idea behind building something literally called the America Bomber means that the US was on Hitler's list. And that, says Duffy, was just part of it. In 1941, the Nazi regime started planning for a post-war world. First and foremost, that meant a massive navy with hundreds of submarines, anchored by 25 battleships and 150 destroyers. In the spring of 1941, Life magazine sent correspondent and former Belgian ambassador John Cudahy to report on what was happening in Germany. Cudahy got a sit-down with Adolf Hitler himself, who started by pointing out that convoys, just like the ones that the US was sending to Britain, signified war. So Cudahy got right to the point and asked Hitler what his plans were regarding the US. He explained that most Americans backed the idea of going to war against Nazi Germany because they were afraid that once Europe fell, they'd be next. Speaking through a translator, Hitler called the idea preposterous. Cudahy wrote, He laughed at that and refused to take me seriously. He said the idea of a Western Hemisphere invasion was about as fantastic as an invasion of the moon. According to Cudahy, Hitler went on to say that, he had too high an opinion of the intelligence and good sense of Americans. The logistics didn't work. Millions of troops would need to be moved across the Atlantic for the Nazis to gain a foothold in the US. That meant there was absolutely nothing for America to worry about. At least Hitler said so. But rational thought and reasoning weren't his strongest qualities. In order to talk about what Hitler might have had in store for the US, it's worth mentioning just why he might want to see that part of the world burn, at least eventually. According to University of North Carolina Emeritus Professor of History Gerhard L. Weinberg, Hitler had been writing about taking out the US as far back as the 1920s. While he wanted global domination for Germany and all that, he also felt like it was sort of his moral obligation to right a perceived wrong, and that skewed his view in favor of war with the US. It all went back to the stab-in-the-back myth which the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum describes as the belief that Germans' loss in World War I came not on the battlefield, but because of espionage, sabotage, and subterfuge on the home front. All that was, of course, supposedly led by those who would become enemies of the Nazi state, including Jews, liberals, and communists. At the same time, it meant that America didn't really have all that much to do with Germany's loss. Therefore, America wasn't a military might that needed to be contended with. But what historian and author James P. Duffy says was described as Europe's greatest future rival. That meant Hitler believed he could wrap up the war in Europe, take his sweet time building up a navy, then deal with the US. Adolf Hitler famously wrote Mein Kampf, but less famously, he wrote a second book, the very directly named Hitler's Zweites Book, or Hitler's Second Book. According to Target America, Hitler's plan to attack the United States. The book was written in 1928, but not published until 1961. It outlined a series of three conflicts, and it wasn't until the third one that Hitler got around to the USA. First, Hitler saw his Germany taking on France to regain what they'd lost post-World War I. Then, he was going to head east and seize all the land and agricultural resources he needed from the Soviet Union. And then, on to America which he wrote was a real threat to German domination of the world. But here's the thing. Hitler wrote that analysis before the Great Depression got into full swing. As he watched what was unfolding across the Atlantic, he eventually came to the conclusion that America was so weakened by her own problems that it didn't really matter. The Third War could wait. According to Gerhard L. Weinberg, 
Hitler believed that wrapping up the war in Europe, stabilizing his Third Reich, and building up an army of long-range forces was all something he could take his time doing. America, he thought, was too weak to do anything but wait. There's a lot that's been written about Adolf Hitler's obsession with taking on the Soviet Union, but according to Cambridge historian Brendan Sims, he was just as obsessed with the US. So much so, Sims told ex-Berliner, that it shaped policies across the Third Reich. Sims explains that the more research he did, the more he found about Hitler's focus on America. It became absolutely obvious that Anglo-America, that's my phrase, Hitler tended to refer to them as the Anglo-Saxons, was the biggest kid on the block, his main focus, his main enemy, the partner he would have liked, the biggest element of his reality. That's a massive claim, and Sim says that there were a few layers to Hitler casting his greedy eye toward the US. Part of it started with the US having something that Germany didn't. Size. Let's put that in perspective. The US is about 28 times the size of Germany, but that only tells part of the story. Germany could fit inside California and take up about only 85% of the state. It's also about the same size as Montana and New Mexico, give or take a bit. Even if Hitler had managed to take over all of Europe, building his master race would require a ton of space and a ton of resources, which America has in abundance. Adolf Hitler was front and center at World War I's Second Battle of the Marne, and according to Cambridge historian Brendan Sims, it was there that he had a run-in with two American soldiers who made a massive impression. They were tall, blonde, and blue-eyed. Sound familiar? Hitler's attempts to build his master Aryan race are well documented, and Sim says there's another, often overlooked part of that. Hitler developed a theory that one of the richest places to find all that Aryan DNA he was so obsessed with was the USA. Conquering America meant all new seeds from which his Aryan race could grow. The theory went like this. Over the course of hundreds of years, the US population had been reinforced by immigrants from Europe. Remember, the United States is a nation of immigrants. People came here to avoid war in Europe. They weren't just any immigrants, either. They were the brightest, the strongest, the most adventurous, and the most resilient. They left behind a Europe that was overcrowded, disease-ridden, and famished. They headed west and settled in the US. There, they thrived with wide open spaces and resources of the type only America could offer. And United States laws helped reinforce his ideas about just how pure their blood was. Legislation limited or outlawed immigration from certain areas of Europe, like the Slavic countries, along with interracial marriages. In other words, he saw the US as an invaluable source of genetic material. Henry Ford is often lauded as the father of the American automobile industry. But here's the thing. While he was a genius when it came to industry and manufacturing, he was a terrible person. Ford was a raging anti-Semite. Ford blamed the Jewish people for everything from world war to short skirts, cheap movies, and jazz music. And PBS says that he was often quoted saying that all the world's ills could be traced back to Jews or to the Jewish capitalists. And if that's the sort of thing that seems like it would have Hitler singing, you've got a friend in me, it absolutely was. According to Bradley W. Hart, author of Hitler's American Friends, it was even more than that. Ford was spouting anti-Semitic rhetoric long before mainstream America knew about things like the concentration camps, and his views didn't go unnoticed by Hitler. According to research from The Nation, Ford profited heavily from manufacturing for the Third Reich, even for months after the U.S. officially declared war. A contemporary report from the U.S. Treasury Department shows they knew about it, summed up in this observation. There would seem to be at least a tacit acceptance by Ford's son, Mr. Edsel Ford of the Reliance, on the known neutrality of the Ford family as a basis of receipt of favors from the German Reich. In July 1938, Ford accepted Germany's Grand Cross, the highest honor the Third Reich could bestow on a foreigner. Hart goes on to say that Hitler saw Ford as a way into America, and he uncovered records describing how Hitler had tapped Heinrich Ford to become what Hitler described as the leader of the growing fascist movement in America. World War II usually plays out as an allies versus Axis conflict, but it wasn't that neat and tidy. According to the National World War II Museum, the US had a faction of Nazis that weren't just alive and well. They were holding rallies at venues like Madison Square Garden. The German-American Bund dated back to 1936, and the entire idea behind the organization was to promote all the ideals and racial hatred that went along with being a Nazi. That Madison Square Garden event attracted about 22,000 loyal members in 1939, and it was done under the command of a German World War I veteran named Fritz Kuhn. 
The Bund, of course, got the attention of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. And while they were found not to be a threat to national security, there is an interesting footnote. One of the claims used to discredit the Bund was that Kuhn reported directly to Hitler and that Hitler was meddling in U.S. affairs. It makes sense that Hitler would be thrilled to have a Nazi party ready and waiting for him. But not only was that not true, but according to traces, Hitler outright denounced the party. Why? Because the Nazis thought the Bund was giving them a bad name. Names like Dachau and Auschwitz are instantly recognizable, but they made up only a sliver of a percentage of the facilities the Nazi regime built to contain, enslave, and execute those they didn't like. Here's a terrifying statistic. According to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, there were more than 44,000 camps of varying purposes, all detention and incarceration based, that were active during the Third Reich. Would those camps have been set up in North America? According to the CBC, probably. In 2019, the Library and Archives Canada purchased a book that had been taken from Hitler's personal library. It was called what translates to Statistics, Press, and Organizations of Jewry in the United States and Canada. The 137-page book is essentially a compilation of data on Jewish populations across North America. What this book shows us is that there was already the beginnings of a plan had the war gone differently that the Holocaust would have happened here. And as the LAC curator Michael Kent explained, this information would have been the building blocks to rolling out the final solution in Canada. The book, written by Nazi linguist Heinz Kloss, details things from ethnicity and languages of cities' populations to listing Jewish organizations. And Kent further explained to The Guardian that the book is essentially proof that Hitler and the Nazi party had plans to expand the Holocaust to North America. Kent said, The Holocaust wasn't a European event. It was an event that didn't have the opportunity to spread out of Europe. The views and goals of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party were so polarizing that there's not too much room for fence sitting. Either you agreed or you disagreed. And fortunately, there were plenty of ordinary people who put their feet down and said, we're not going to stand for this. Fritz Gerlich was a member of what's arguably one of the most dangerous, most influential professions in the world, journalism. Born in Germany in 1883, he was editor-in-chief of a newspaper when he had a sit-down chat with Hitler. And he didn't like what he heard, even in 1923. When his newspaper later fell in line with Nazi propaganda, Gerlich left to start his own paper, Der Gera de Wie. In it, he made it clear that extremism wasn't the Germany he loved, and when Hitler's niece was killed in 1931 by the dictator's personal pistol, Gerlich made it clear just what he thought that Hitler had ordered her death. Gerlich went hard into the investigation into her murder and absolutely published what he found, that Hitler was involved. Gerlich continued to mock and ridicule Hitler in the very public forum, even using the Nazis' beloved racial sciences to prove Hitler wasn't even Aryan. He was, by his own definition, Mongol and Slavic. Gerlich wrote, Hitler's attitude is absolutely un-Nordic and un-Germanic. It is absolute despotism and can be explained by the fact that this man is a typical bastard. It's unsurprising that on March 9, 1934, Nazi stormtroopers raided Gerlich's offices, destroyed everything, and shipped him off to Dachau. He was killed more than a year later on June 30, 1934, a night that became known as the Night of the Long Knives. His wife was mailed his bloody glasses. Virginia Hall had such a natural talent for espionage that it was only after a chance meeting and minimal training that she became one of the first spies the British sent in France, and her story is the stuff of legend. The nation was already occupied by the Nazis in 1941, and she started gathering her info by getting friendly with the owner of a brothel. Why? They were more than happy to pass along information her girls heard from the chatty Gestapo agents who came calling. Paul ultimately went on to become crucial to the organization of the French resistance while still remaining a shadowy, elusive figure. Klaus Barbie, the head of the Gestapo in France, plastered Paris with wanted posters and did almost manage to catch her after she sprang allies from a prison camp. She escaped and embarked on a grueling hike across the Pyrenees Mountains. Shocking 50 miles later, she was arrested in Spain. Her escape is made even more impressive considering she did it while hampered by a heavy wooden leg, one she'd named Cuthbert. Once she finally made it back to Britain, they refused to send her back, so she joined up with the Americans, filed down her teeth so she could pass for a French peasant, and kicked off a campaign of sabotage and reclaiming villages from Nazi occupiers. That's wildly impressive, especially for an agent who was expected to survive in Nazi territory for only a matter of days. She was never captured and died in 1982, having never spoken about her wartime exploits. Children are the future, it said, and Hitler certainly thought so. 
Every German and non-Jewish boy was technically required to join the Hitler Youth, but some kids had other ideas. Among them were the Swing Judent, or Swing Kids. They weren't exactly an organized group of active resistors, but they showed their complete dislike of Nazi ideals by being the exact opposite of the clean-cut, disciplined, uniformed, and proper members of the Hitler Youth. These were the kids who met in secret, accepted anyone regardless of their religion, and embraced jazz, swing dancing, and the teenage culture of Britain and the U.S. Their festivals were described as, quote, an appalling sight, where teens, quote, all jitterbugged on the stage like wild animals. The swing unit earned the ire of Heinrich Himmler in particular. Himmler targeted the so-called ringleaders of the swing unit for deportation to concentration camps, where they would be sentenced for up to three years for their disobedience. It's such a waste. So much passion. For nothing. The rebellious actions of the Swing Judent escalated as the war went on, and by 1942, there were members of the group in camps like Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, and Bergen-Belsen. The rebellion continued inside, where some groups reassembled to sing for other prisoners. World War II, it's important to remember that being German and being Nazi weren't necessarily the same things. Some Germans did everything in their power to bring down or at least damage the regime from the shadows. Hans Scholl and his sister Sophie were among the founders of the resistance group the White Rose. In 2013, White Rose member Lieselette First Romdor explained the group's motivation to the BBC. The war was dreadful, with the battles and so many people dying, and Hitler was a megalomaniac, and so they had to do something. First Romdor had already lost her husband to the fighting by the time she joined, and the group was already in full swing. They had begun writing and printing leaflets, telling the truth about the Nazi regime and encouraging resistance, while taking to the streets at night to cover the buildings of Munich in anti-Nazi graffiti. The Scholl siblings were distributing their leaflets at the University of Munich when they were arrested. They were put on trial and ultimately executed as traitors. The Gestapo continued to hunt the remaining members of the White Rose, and First Ramdor was also arrested. After spending about a month in custody, she was released and trailed by the Gestapo, who were still looking for other members. In 1943, Allied aircraft dropped millions of copies of the last White Rose leaflet across Germany. His name was Ivan Sidorenko, and like many, he didn't find his true calling until it came and found him. Sidorenko was an artist who signed up with the Soviet Army at the beginning of the war, and he was originally assigned to an infantry and artillery unit during 1941's Battle of Moscow. He would regularly wander off on his own during his downtime, and that's when he found out he was really good at sneaking around and killing Germans before they even knew he was there. The higher-ups saw some serious potential and started sending Sidorenko out to do what he had been doing on his own, usually with a student or two in tow. Not only did he teach his methods, which were based on his philosophy of one shot, one kill to hundreds of other students, but by the end of the war, he would be credited with around 500 kills. And that's not just individual soldiers. Sidorenko would destroy entire supply vehicles, tanks, and tanker trucks with explosive bullets. He was wounded in 1944 and was forced to sit out the rest of the war, but he and his snipers had done their job. In spite of the counter-snipers, the Germans deployed solely to target them. Publicly denouncing the Nazi regime and their actions was a great way to find yourself on a crowded train headed to a terrible and often final destination. Still, speaking out against Hitler's policies was exactly what Clemens August Count von Galen spent much of the war doing. And that was a huge problem for the Third Reich, because he was Germany's Bishop of Munster. In 1939, Hitler gave the go-ahead to start killing patients considered incurable. That became known as Operation T4 and targeted those with mental and physical disabilities. Parents of children with disabilities were encouraged to drop their kids off at specific locations, and by 1940, dedicated gas chambers had been set up around the country. The program led to the deaths of at least 70,273 people and was vocally condemned by Bishop von Galen. He put such pressure on the Nazis that Hitler officially ended the program on August 29, 1941, although the practice itself continued and von Galen continued to speak out against everything from the Nazi theories of racial superiority to their euthanasia programs. Von Galen's status within the church protected him from direct retribution, but that protection didn't extend to a number of the priests who repeated his anti-Nazi sermons. Norway had a complicated position during the war. They were originally neutral, but the Nazi war machine invaded in April 1940 and set up an occupation, much as they did with France. What followed was a lot of German insistence that their way was now the only way, and a lot of Norwegians pointing out that no, that wasn't how it was going to work at all. That resistance was led by the nation's teachers. The Nazis weren't just out to win the war, they were trying to lay the groundwork for the new world they wanted to see spring from a Nazi victory. 
to that end, they pushed teachers to feature only Nazi-friendly curriculums in their classrooms. When they tried that with Norway, around 8,000 teachers refused. Hitler installed a prime minister sympathetic to the cause, and when the education system as a whole outright pushed back, that's when P.N. Wittgen Kischling decided to make an example and sent 499 teachers to forced labor camps that had been set up north of the Arctic Circle. Parents were almost overwhelmingly supportive of the teachers as they lived in the far reaches of the freezing north with only cardboard shelters and supplies smuggled in from sympathetic families. And they won. When their plight went public, they were sent home, and they never taught the Nazis' educational program in their schools. Kischling, meanwhile, was described as broken by the resistance. After the war, he was executed for treason, and his name has become a synonym for traitor. When Lyudmila Pavlichenka enlisted in 1941, recruiters first tried to push her into the field of nursing. Once they realized how good she was with a gun, though, they put her into the 25th Rifle Division of the Red Army, and they made her a sniper. It wasn't long before the Germans were saying her name, Lady Death, in fear. Her patience and self-control were legendary, once remaining in the same place for three days before getting a clear shot of her target. That target was just one of many, and even as she accumulated 309 confirmed kills, she faced off with German officers who, when they discovered they couldn't kill her, decided to bribe her with an officer's position in their army. She never wavered. After being wounded for a fourth time, Pavlichenko was sent to the U.S. to raise support for the war, which she did in an epic way. After deflecting comments about her uniform and her femininity, she asked the crowd, Gentlemen, I am 25 years old and I have killed 309 fascist occupants by now. Don't you think, gentlemen, that you have been hiding behind my back for too long? Pavlichenko never returned to the field. Instead, she trained the snipers who went to war after her, and her story doesn't have a happy ending. Suffering from depression and PTSD, she died in 1974 at age 58. Today, we know what was going on in the network of concentration camps set up by the Nazis. But when they invaded Poland in 1939, no one had the foggiest idea what was going on. And in order to find out, one member of the Polish resistance said goodbye to his young wife and children and volunteered to head off into the very depths of hell on earth. That man was Witold Pilecki. He got himself arrested and sent to Auschwitz, and it very nearly ended in a fast and brutal way. Narrowly avoiding being one of the ten men pulled aside and shot as an example to others, he was told, The rations have been calculated so that you will only survive six weeks. Polecki organized an underground resistance within the camp, and at the same time he was smuggling information out, he was conducting operations to steal food, sabotage the Nazis, and spread what little information he received back into the camp. He and his crew even took out a good number of SS guards by some creative methods, like electing typhus carrying lice and infecting the clothing of the officers. In 1943, Pilecki, now sick and frail, escaped. His messages had made it all the way to Allied Command in London and were an invaluable source of intel, and his story isn't a happy one. Suffering from depression and PTSD, he later fought in support of a free Poland and in 1947 was arrested and executed as an enemy of communism. One French resistance member described the woman nicknamed the White Mouse like this, She is the most feminine woman I know until the fighting starts, and she is like five men. Credited with needing nothing more than her bare hands to kill an SS guard, Nancy Wake was the one who went on record as saying, In my humble opinion, the only good German was a dead one, and the deader the better. I rejoiced in the fact that I killed him. She went on to add, I'm sorry I couldn't kill more. This was the Australian woman who picked up and moved to London when she was just 16, and who later had the misfortune to be living in France when it fell to Nazi occupation. She started out carrying messages for the resistance, but after fleeing to Britain, the Gestapo right on her heels, she returned to train guerrilla fighters and head up an arm of the resistance that ultimately had more than 7,000 members. Wake's exploits are nothing short of legendary, and the one she dubbed the most useful was bicycling just over 300 miles in less than 72 hours to deliver secret codes. She was also behind the network that smuggled hundreds of allies out of Nazi territory, arranged weapons drops, trained thousands for D-Day, and made the hard decisions, including interrogating suspected Nazi spies and, in at least one case, sentencing them to execution. In spite of the bounty the Gestapo placed on her head, Wake survived the war. She died in 2011 at 98 years old. I don't know what, but if ever I can do something one day, I'll do it. And that is why. Usually, history tends to remember those who protested against the Nazi regime as the good guys, but here's the weird thing. The group that branded themselves the Edelweiss Pirates is still remembered as a loose criminal organization. And that's strange. Historians are fighting to turn their legacy from petty thieves into resistance fighters, 
and it's pretty dark stuff. Jean Yulich is one of the survivors, and he recounted how his father had been beaten and dragged from his home alongside his mother and aunt, and how he had been sent to an orphanage. Later told he needed to join the Hitler Youth, the memory was still fresh for Yulich. So instead, he joined a less formal group called the Edelweiss Pirates, and at their peak, there were about 3,000 in their home city of Cologne. While they started out singing songs and pulling pranks, it escalated along the war. Soon they were smashing the windows of factories, destroying Nazi transportation, and even derailing trains. Clearly, the Nazis were not cool with this. They were condemned as riffraff that threatened the Nazi foundations of the German youth, and on November 10, 1944, they made a show of hanging 13 Edelweiss pirates, including Eulish's friend, 16-year-old Bartholomew Schink. Even though Ian Fleming never confirmed exactly who was the inspiration for the James Bond franchise's Money Penny, it's pretty clear the answer is Vera Atkins. Atkins, who died in 2000 at the age of 92, was at the head of the Special Operations Executive Spy Agency's F Division. Those were the units that were sent into France, and Hitler was so fed up with them that he famously promised they were going to be among the first he hanged when he got to London. He, of course, never got there, and Atkins had a lot to do with that. She was in charge of training the spies in what might be the most valuable part of being a successful agent, blending in. Not only was she responsible for wartime training, but she also proved a force to be reckoned with post-war. That's when she took the names of the 117 division members who had died at the hands of the Nazis and promised to get them each justice. And she did. She spent more than a year traveling Europe and interrogating everyone from concentration camp guards to Rudolf Hess. And those already on the front called her one of the most effective interrogators working for the Allies. Not only was she able to determine exactly what had happened to the missing agents, but when she suggested to Hess that he had overseen 1.5 million deaths, he confessed the actual number. 2,345,000. First, a bit of background on the Lebensborn program. The program was, in a nutshell, started by Heinrich Himmler as a sort of selective breeding project designed to create a master race. In some cases, children who fit the racial profile were plucked from the arms of the women who gave birth to them in concentration camps, adopted into Nazi families, and never knew where they really came from. That's where a Polish midwife named Stanisława Leszczynska comes in. She was sent to Auschwitz in 1943, after spending four years helping smuggle Jews out of Łódź ghetto. She was tasked with caring for pregnant women, and in this case, she quickly found that caring for meant killing the majority of the newborn babies. Leszczynska not only refused, but she stood up to Joseph Mengele to do so. No one is really sure why she wasn't executed, but instead she was sent back into the camp and worked to at least save the mothers that she could. Along the way, she secretly tattooed the babies who were born and then taken away to be shuttled into the Lebensborn program. It's estimated that she delivered around 3,000 babies, and about 500 were taken away and adopted into other families. Thanks to her, many had the chance to learn where they really came from. It's hard to understate the sheer scale of World War II, so maybe it'll come as no surprise to find that beneath all the heroics and atrocities, there are still a few mysteries that haven't been solved, even to this day. Here are some of the strangest of all. For the people of Los Angeles, February 25th, 1942 is one of the tensest days of the entire war. On this day, in the early morning hours, military personnel and civilians alike were alerted to an incoming bombing raid over the city. Searchlights swept across the night sky while people sat in their blacked out homes, quietly wondering if Japanese forces had been emboldened by their attack on Pearl Harbor months earlier. Their fears seemed to be confirmed when anti-aircraft guns began going off around 3 a.m., first in Santa Monica and then across the rest of the region. Troops were even ordered to open fire where some had seen an object floating through the sky. But when the smoke cleared, there was no sign of any attempted Japanese attack. Five people died as a result of the so-called Battle of Los Angeles, three from a car accident and two from heart attacks, while a few buildings were damaged by anti-aircraft shells that hadn't detonated in the air. So what happened? Well, the Secretary of the Navy basically chalked it up to nerves, calling the whole thing a false alarm based on faulty radar readings. Some witnesses swore they saw enemy airplanes soaring through the sky, however, while others suggested a weather balloon might have been to blame. A small number of people even claimed that it was all down to flying saucers. Sadly, nobody has ever produced any strong evidence one way or another. World War II aircraft crews had plenty to worry about, to say the least. Flying comes with its own difficulties even in peacetime, such as navigation and the need to refuel. But when you're flying in a war zone, you also need to deal with, you know, enemies. But by far the strangest hazard of all for World War II-era aircraft were Foo Fighters. And no, we don't mean these guys. 
Foo Fighters were first reported by the Associated Press in 1945, though Allied flight crews had been seeing them at least a year before that. These crews often reported seeing balls of light that behaved strangely, typically following other planes and then peeling off or simply disappearing after a matter of minutes. Some of them even flashed and flew in formation, leading some airmen to believe that they were enemy weapons. But there are no reports that Foo Fighters ever attacked or otherwise harmed any aircraft or its occupants. They didn't even register on radar. So if these weird lights weren't German weapons, then what were they? Many have blamed combat fatigue that plagued hardworking crews, though many of the airmen themselves rankled at the idea that they had basically been hallucinating. One common suggestion, the visible electrical discharge known as St. Elmo's Fire, doesn't really explain the strange movements of these lights either. Despite a CIA investigation in 1953, no one has ever been able to come up with a satisfactory answer for them. In 1941, a Scottish farmer found a burning plane in his field and a strange man standing beside it. The man claimed to be someone named Captain David Horn, but it soon became clear that was a blatant lie. In fact, Horn was a real Nazi politician named Rudolf Hess, who had flown from Germany to Scotland, evading anti-aircraft artillery and radar detection along the way until finally crash-landing in that field. But why would such a high-ranking member of the Nazi regime leave his position and literally throw himself into the heart of enemy territory? Hess claimed he wanted to broker peace between the Nazis and sympathetic British officials, but many remained skeptical of this claim. Some simply believed that Hess was mentally ill. His genuine shock that he was treated as a prisoner and not a diplomat after being arrested certainly didn't help his case in that regard. After his arrest and subsequent imprisonment, Hess apparently realized that he was in very dire straits indeed. He attempted suicide on multiple occasions during the course of the war, but survived to be jailed in the Allied-controlled Spandau prison. Finally, in 1987, the 93-year-old Hess was found dead in prison. One of Adolf Hitler's most fanatical followers, his deputy Fuhrer Rudolf Hess, died today at the age of 93. His death was ruled as a suicide, although his son has repeatedly insisted, albeit with no supporting evidence, that he was actually murdered by British intelligence. Nearly a year to the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Navy radar spotted a single aircraft approaching the area on course from Japan. They quickly scrambled two planes to intercept the newcomer, and the pilots reported spotting an American P-40 fighter that had been riddled with bullet holes. The pilot inside apparently waved at them, but appeared to be covered in blood. The plane crashed on land soon after, but inspection of the wreckage showed no evidence that there had ever been a pilot in the first place. So where did the plane come from? Who was its pilot? And most importantly, can the story even be believed? Well, the bad news is that this tale is almost certainly made up. It shares a close resemblance to a story written by Robert Lee Scott Jr., a writer who also served as a pilot during World War II. Scott later said that he and a fellow pilot had come up with the story to stay entertained during the long days of the war, but would never have said anything if they knew it was going to grow into an urban legend. Raoul Wallenberg is rightfully considered a hero of World War II. He was a Swedish diplomat who, through his position as deputy secretary at the Swedish embassy in Budapest, helped thousands of Jewish people flee the Nazis via Hungary. In early 1945, however, he was apprehended by Soviet officers, and despite not being accused of any particular crime, quickly disappeared into the Soviet prison system. Some wonder if the Soviets had suspected him of spying for the Americans. Others think that the Soviet Union wanted to hit Sweden hard for its pro-Nazi policies earlier in the war. Either way, Wallenberg's eventual fate has never been fully known. The Swedish government didn't do much to follow his case, as they were reluctant to become embroiled in Cold War politics. The Soviets later claimed that Wallenberg had died of a heart attack in Lubyanka on July 17, 1947, but some people swore that they had crossed paths with Wallenberg as late as the 1980s. Researchers claim that there are still more records of Wallenberg's movements somewhere out there, but until the Russian government releases them, the true fate of this heroic diplomat will remain a mystery. Named for the German word for treasure hunter, Schatzgraber was a station established by the Nazis just 620 miles from the North Pole. It was strategically situated to interfere with Allied transports moving troops and supplies through the Arctic, and also provided valuable weather information to the Germans. But Schatzgraber was abandoned in 1944 when staff grew sick after eating raw polar bear meat. Hey, it happens. But why not bring in a new crew to man the station, considering how important it was to the Nazis? And why didn't anybody reveal the station's existence until well after the war in 1953? While other explanations for Schatzgraber's existence include the idea that the Nazis were conducting archaeological excavations for mysterious Nordic artifacts. Considering many Nazis were fascinated by the occult and practically revered the mystical Nordic past that they believed legitimized their regime, it's entirely possible that Schatzgraber may have been connected to this bizarre Nazi obsession. 
The Amber Room was located inside the Catherine Palace, a royal palace in Pushkin, Russia. Previously, it had been in St. Petersburg's Winter Palace, and before that, Prussia's Charltenburg Palace. It was given as a gift by Prussian King Frederick William I to Peter the Great in 1716, after the Russian royal visited Frederick William's place and took a particular liking to the room. This place was seriously fancy, too. The Amber Room was constructed out of multiple tons of amber panels, each backed with gold. Later renovations added even more glitz and glamour to the room, to the point where many dubbed it the eighth wonder of the world. When invading Nazi soldiers entered the Amber Room in 1941, the panels were nowhere to be found, or at least that's what it seemed like. In fact, fleeing officials had plastered the panels with wallpaper, hoping to mask them from the invaders, but the ruse was quickly uncovered by the Germans. Just a few days later, they had shipped the amber panels to Konensburg, Germany. And that's where the disassembled amber room was last spotted. After that, the trail goes cold, and nobody's really sure what happened to it. Some suspect that it's now at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, after a steamer was sunk near there in 1945. Others think that the panels were destroyed in air raids, or maybe still hidden somewhere in storage. We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top men. There's no shortage of legends about lost Nazi treasure out there, but some of the other Axis powers figure into these mysteries, too. Take Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita, for example. Yamashita reportedly buried looted treasure somewhere in the Philippines while Japanese forces were occupying the nation. When he was executed by American forces in 1946, however, any hope of finding the treasure was dashed. Of course, that's assuming that it's even real. Many people have searched for Yamashita's gold in the intervening decades, despite the total lack of evidence or records supporting the tale, and have invariably come up with nothing. That hasn't deterred anyone, though. The fabled treasure hoard was even at the center of a 1988 court case brought against former Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos by a soldier named Rogelio Rojas. Rojas claimed that he had found part of that hoard, but that Marcos had promptly swooped in and seized it. A court later found in his favor and awarded Rojas his own hoard of cash in 1996. Unfortunately, by that point, Rojas had been dead for three years. The official cause of death was tuberculosis, though some people insist he was killed for his role in the supposed discovery of Yamashita's gold. The region of Lower Silesia in modern-day Poland was once considered to be a part of Germany. War being what it is, borders have since shifted, and the German occupants of the region fled over the course of World War II. The Polish people who took their place have since uncovered treasures left behind by their German predecessors, and, as the legend goes, there may be more valuable loot still left uncovered. One of the most colorful stories claims that there is an entire underground train full of plundered Nazi treasure buried in a collapsed tunnel somewhere in Poland. It's certainly true that the Nazis built underground tunnels, and they did indeed steal cultural treasures and valuables from occupied territories. This has apparently been more than enough evidence for some treasure hunters, including one or two who insist they stumbled upon it in the past. Still, nobody has ever managed to provide the location of the Nazi gold train, or proof that it even exists at all. Towards the end of the war and in its aftermath, a number of Nazis and other fascists left Europe to escape the consequences of their defeat. Some high-placed intellectuals like Nazi rocket scientist Werner von Braun were quietly rescued via Operation Paperclip, which relocated some 1,600 German scientists and their family members to America. Other Nazis disappeared from Europe at the end of the war, too, with many only reappearing decades later. For example, Adolf Eichmann was captured in Argentina by the Mossad in 1960, while Auschwitz's so-called Angel of Death, Joseph Mengele, lived out a quiet life in Brazil until 1979. So how could these criminals have gotten so far and evaded capture for so long, with some escaping punishment entirely? Well, the escape networks used by the Nazis were eventually known as rat lines, though it's still not clear who was involved, how the rat lines ran, and how much everyone knew about the whole affair. What is clear is that many South American countries seem to be full of government officials who were more than happy to ignore the Nazis fleeing to their shores, and evidence seems to suggest that Vatican officials also played a significant role in aiding Nazi war criminals as they fled Europe. Some have even claimed that Pope Pius XII knew more than he was letting on, though the exact nature of his involvement in the rat lines is still a mystery to this day. Much has been written about America's World War II Japanese internment camps, but you probably don't know about the POW camps that housed combatants from Europe. Here's how they earned a notable place in the war's history. As documented by the Society for Military History, because of the United States' limited experience dealing with POWs, the country chose to follow the edicts of the 1929 Geneva Convention. The foundational objectives of the convention were to, quote, prevent indignities against enemy soldiers, and to ensure that American POWs would be equally protected when held by enemy nations. Unfortunately, while the U.S. generally honored the convention, neither Japan, which never signed the agreement, nor Germany, which chose to ignore it, did. 
The far-reaching 1929 convention covered such things as camp location, punishments for escapes, and restrictions regarding POW labor. Among the many protections and guarantees provided for the POWs were adequate food, housing, medical care, protection from violence, intimidation, insults, and public curiosity, prohibition against medical experimentation, and reciprocal military rights and status. To create rights and status equal to the American military, German officers above the rank of captain were assigned their own POW orderlies, and generals were housed in private huts. American soldiers were compelled to salute higher-ranking POWs, and the infamous Nazi salute was even permitted. The convention allowed the display of swastikas, and some POWs were buried in local military cemeteries with Nazi flags and with swastikas engraved on their headstones. Undoubtedly, the biggest source of conflict in the POW camps were the ardent Nazis. Because the Geneva Convention limited how differently one POW could be treated from another, camp authorities initially made no distinction between soldiers with different ideological stances. Ergo, fanatical Nazis were thrown in with anti-Nazis. Furthermore, Article 43 of the convention required the appointment of POW administrators, and Nazi officers would often assume this role, becoming in effect camp commandants. They ruled with an iron fist, ordering work stoppages and holding kangaroo courts. The hardliners doled out harsh discipline and attacked fellow prisoners for their lack of patriotism, among other offenses. There were documented occurrences of murder, forced suicides, a general camp riot, and other acts of violence. Nazi perpetrators usually received minimal or no punishment as they were protected by the convention. Some were transferred to a special camp for Nazi incorrigibles in Oklahoma. The War Department eventually acknowledged the problem and began to enact reforms. As all the work done by POWs was forced labor, a major concern of the Geneva Convention was the matter of work regulations, including details like job locations, hours, hazards, and pay rates. POWs were put to work right from the start, although their assignments were limited due to the fears of escape, sabotage, and overseas exploitation. But when labor shortages due to the enlistment hit the American economy, the War Department rethought its strategy and greatly expanded POW labor. The camps supplied local industries and businesses with laborers while still adhering to the convention. In Texas, for example, POWs picked cotton, harvested fruit, and chopped sugar. Over in Kansas, they stacked hay and did masonry. And in New England, they harvested peas, cabbage, and apples. They also reportedly worked in hundreds of other positions, including mechanics, sign painters, tailors, and lumberjacks. Yes, a lumberjack! All enlisted men were required to work, and they were paid 80 cents a day, the same rate that American privates received. To keep them from accumulating enough cash to bankroll and escape, prisoners were paid in canteen coupons. Over time, the POWs not only proved themselves capable workers, they also earned the trust and admiration of many of their private employers. As a result, their supervision was relaxed, sometimes to the point of being unguarded. As detailed in the Washington Post in 1997, the War Department went above and beyond when it came to POW food, education, and entertainment. Not only did POWs dine well, they took college courses, set up libraries, and formed orchestras and soccer leagues. Leisure activities included ping pong, chess, card games, and the screening of movies and cartoons. Some camps even had printing presses that churned out newsletters penned by POWs. Additionally, POWs mounted theatrical productions and played concerts that were regularly attended by American officers. Also, there were circus and acrobatic instruction taught by professional circus performers. Educational programs were varied. Some classes were taught by the POWs themselves, where others were conducted as correspondence courses. The level of instruction was so high that some German universities offered full credit to returning POWs. Although some in Congress decried this apparent coddling of the POWs, the War Department remained confident that news of the benefits enjoyed by the POWs would reach Germans still fighting overseas and encourage their surrender. When the first wave of POWs from Germany's elite Africa Corps arrived in Mahia, Texas, the townspeople were reportedly dumbstruck. They stared as the POWs marched in orderly rows to the camp. Similar scenes played out across rural America, but over time, many of these small communities adjusted to the POW presence. Some even began to appreciate the novelty of it all, as reported by the Washington Post. Many locals recognized the vital role that the POWs played in their local businesses, and quite a few even befriended their captive employees and continued relationships after the war. In Kansas, for example, some farmers invited their POW workers for meals and allowed them to go hunting or pony riding unattended. However, not all towns and townspeople were happy hosts. In Texas, some residents reportedly feared having Nazis nearby and locked their doors and cautioned their daughters. Other citizens wrote angry letters and staged protests. 
As the war dragged on and American casualties mounted, stories about cushy POW camp life and vicious crimes committed by Nazi prisoners enraged many Americans. The War Department was sensitive to public perception and aware that POWs were actually eating better than many civilians, so they cut back severely on the POW's rations. Although the total number of escaped attempts from American camps was proportionately low, some POWs did make a go for it. The 1929 Geneva Convention recognized that it is the duty of prisoners to attempt escape, so it contains numerous regulations limiting the severity of punishments for escapees. Consequently, the POWs had little concern about getting caught. Some did so out of homesickness, some out of patriotism, and others out of fear of being returned to their altered homeland. Methods of escape were as varied as the reasons for trying. POWs built secret tunnels, slipped away from inattentive guards, constructed dummies of themselves, and impersonated American officers, among other tricks. Once outside, they hopped trains or stole cars, or they simply took off on foot. The most elaborate escape attempt occurred in 1944 at one of the more Spartan camps in Texas. Using a secret 60-foot tunnel equipped with lighting and air bellows, 12 German officers slipped away from their barracks and went separately toward Mexico armed with tissue paper maps. Each man had food and a change of clothing. Despite their careful planning, 10 were captured within days far from the border, while two were caught by an El Paso railroad detective just before reaching the border. The majority of escapees were captured quickly and without incident. Back at camp, fellow POWs hailed them as heroes. As chronicled by the Associated Press, on a September night in 1945, POW Georg Gertner escaped from New Mexico's Camp Deming by slipping under a fence and hopping a train bound for San Pedro. Gertner had decided to escape because he knew that upon his release, he would be repatriated to eastern Germany where his family lived and which had fallen under Russian control. As a former Nazi, Gertner feared he would be sent to a gulag. From San Pedro, Gertner traveled north undetected, taking a series of odd jobs on the west coast as a fruit picker, logger, and ski instructor. In Oakland, he landed a steady salesman job, and in 1964, he met his wife, Jean. Now going by the name Dennis Wiles, Gertner told Jean that he had been raised in an orphanage. Gertner remained under the radar for years, and eventually authorities stopped looking for him. Jean was unaware of his secrets until impending retirement required that she obtain his birth certificate. He finally confessed, and Jean, determined that he should turn himself in, began researching the POW camps. Her research led her to Arnold Kramer, who ended up writing a tell-all book with Gertner. In 1985, Gertner surrendered to the INS, and as a publicity stunt on NBC's Today. Of the 2,222 German POWs who attempted escape, he's the only one to have eluded capture. The fact that he kept it a secret for 40 years is what's amazing. Until 1948, the U.S. military was, like much of America, a segregated institution. Black soldiers experienced institutionalized discrimination both at home and overseas. Their prejudicial treatment occurred not only at the hands of white Americans, but white POWs as well. In southern POW camps, some facilities were segregated by race, and black servicemen were given the worst jobs. Blacks in the military expressed outrage that after risking their lives fighting Nazis, they were considered beneath their white enemies back home. The journal article Icons of Insults, German and Italian Prisoners of War and African-American Letters During World War II recounts numerous instances of racist encounters involving white Americans and POWs. In one incident, black servicemen were barred from entering a restaurant at a Texas train station while POWs were invited with their white captors. Another episode involved entertainer Lena Horn, who became enraged while performing at an Arkansas camp when she saw that black servicemen had been seated behind the POWs. In 1944, as Allied victory appeared imminent, American officials began to plan for a post-war Germany. Out of the ruins of fascist defeat, the U.S. and its allies hoped to plant the seeds of democracy. At the same time, stories about Nazi violence and influence in the POW camps were beginning to circulate. When a group of female columnists informed First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt about the situation, she vowed to investigate and take action. The result of this initiative was the Prison of War Special Projects Division, led by Lieutenant Colonel Edward Davison out of Fort Kearney in Rhode Island. To ensure its success in the camps, the project was kept top secret. A hand-picked group of intellectual American officers joined forces with anti-Nazi POWs, and the democracy-promoting strategies of the factory, as it became known, were devised. The factory's first step in the POW camps was the distribution of books banned by Hitler. Complementing that were screenings of carefully selected movies, including horrifying footage showing the liberation of Nazi concentration camps. The factory also created Der Ruf, a German-language newsletter that was written by and for German POWs. To disguise its purpose, the factory POW staff interspersed pro-democracy tracks with fiction and other entertaining fare. 
Although Nazi POWs reportedly denounced their roof as Jewish propaganda, most POWs loved reading it, and its effectiveness at changing hearts and minds was indisputable. After Germany's surrender in May 1945, the process of POW release and repatriation began. But many in America, especially farmers, didn't want them to go. Labor unions, on the other hand, regarded them as competition for returning American forces and demanded their expulsion. President Harry Truman ordered them sent back to Europe. As a result of this order, many POWs ended up in France and England. The last batch of them sailed from New Jersey on July 26, 1946. Although America's treatment to POWs earned high marks for most German prisoners, its repatriation policy was widely criticized. Many transfer POWs reportedly died in France while performing forced labor. According to the journal article Returning to America, German Prisoners of War and American Experience, of the more than half million Germans who immigrated to America between 1947 and 1960, several thousand were former POWs. Having experienced the American way of life, some POWs sought U.S. sponsors or worked for American occupational forces in Germany in order to return to the United States. Welcome back. After the end of World War II, the world scrambled to return to normal, while the Allied victors attempted to bring justice to the Nazis for their crimes against humanity. Rudolf Hess, you must plead guilty or not guilty. Nein. While some were captured, imprisoned, and executed, many managed to flee Germany and live their lives away from the grasp of the Allies. And new evidence shows that some surprising groups helped the Nazis and their collaborators escape to a life of freedom, either by mistake or by design. Some of this aid was unwitting. Over 8,000 Nazis were able to travel to Britain and Canada because they had mistakenly been approved travel documents from the Red Cross. The organization both admitted to and apologized for this, blaming overworked administrators. That's said, the number of accidental approvals on the part of the Red Cross seems to be much higher than previously admitted. Although Britain and Canada took around 8,000 Nazis in 1947, most made their way to Spain and the Americas. In particular, many sought refuge in Argentina, which ironically took in a significant number of Jewish refugees as well. Not every Nazi that reached freedom was an accident though. In particular, the Vatican had a hand in sending thousands of Adolf Hitler's henchmen to a peaceful post-war life by giving them false ideas identities in a purported scheme to return Christianity to the peak of its powers. While the Vatican had an interest in preserving former Nazis within Europe, the Pope himself had his reasons for keeping Adolf Hitler's followers alive and well. Pope Pius XII was staunchly anti-Semitic and anti-communist, and as one of his first acts as Supreme Pontiff, he rehabilitated a French far-right fascist group condemned by his predecessor. The length of his involvement in the Nazi migration is not fully known, but his support for the Nazis who aided anti-communist governments in South America suggests he likely would have approved of the Vatican's methods. In addition, the Red Cross was overwhelmed with refugees at the time and asked the Vatican to help deal with the thousands of travel papers that had piled onto their desks. The result was the spread of Nazis across Europe, North America, and South America, sometimes along with escaping Jews. Though the organization has since condemned its own inaction, at the time it deemed itself too busy with other refugees to fully deal with the situation. Meanwhile, a Nazi sympathizing bishop named Alois Karl Hudal helped create a series of so-called rat lines along which Nazis could flee with their newly acquired false papers. Hudal thought himself a charitable man, rescuing scapegoats of the war, yet reportedly personally secured the safety of significant Holocaust officials. The rat lines extended across Europe, helping some of the most despicable war criminals of the Second World War escape into peace and obscurity in the years following 1945. For example, the concentration camp commander and mass murderer Franz Stangal was escorted to the Vatican and personally met by Bishop of Alois Karl Hudar, who saw Stangol off to Syria and eventually Brazil. The networks of sympathetic houses and hideouts, many of them churches stretched over the Alps, allowing thousands of Nazis to scurry from Austria to Genoa, where they could board ships to sail across the Atlantic. The escape system was so heavily associated with the Catholic Church that it was even referred to as the Monastery Route. This wasn't a highly organized system, however, and it relied heavily on word of mouth and a lot of waiting around on the part of the escaping Nazis. Indeed, the entire operation would likely have fallen apart without the aid and guidance of the church itself. While the extent of Pope Pius XII's involvement in organizing the rat lines isn't entirely known, his inaction before, during, and after the war had aided Hitler's cause greatly.
greatly. Newly opened documents from the closely guarded Vatican archives have revealed the Pope's silence surrounding the genocide of the Jews was not one out of ignorance. He learned of the Holocaust in late 1942, albeit having been told by his pontiff that the reports were exaggerated. Still, he subsequently told the American government that they were not able to confirm whether the Nazis were committing war crimes. By the war's end, Nazis such as Adolf Eichmann, Joseph Mengele, and Klaus Barbie had all made it to the shores of South America, each with their own church-earned passport in hand. While some would eventually be captured, tried, and executed, others lived the rest of their lives in their adopted homes, never to face justice for their heinous crimes. World War II is full of awful things, shining a big old spotlight on the worst side of humanity, and in many cases, the best. It's also full of stories that make you go, that's not real, is it? Truth, like the largely mail-ordered tank division, is stranger than fiction. Concentration camps were singularly terrible places, and there were a lot of them, around 44,000 of varying types and sizes, according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. But for this, let's look at Buchenwald. Adolf Hitler was famously fond of his dog Blondie, but it turns out that's not the only animals that got the A-OK -okay from high-ranking Nazi officials. Buchenwald actually contained a small zoo on the grounds, a zoo that wasn't too far from the crematorium. At the time the zoo opened in 1938, the camp was under the control of Carl Koch and his wife Ilse. On a side note, she was the one who liked to select prisoners who had what she deemed the most artistic tattoos, have them killed, skinned, and made into things like lampshades and clubs. The zoo was, of course, both funded by assets seized from the prisoners and off-limits to all those save the ones who were tasked with taking care of the animals, which included monkeys, birds, and fish. The idea was that it was meant to provide diversion and entertainment for guards who wanted to go there on their breaks. Coke liked to go there, too, because there was also a bear pit, and he was particularly fond of throwing people in and watching the carnage. World War II devastated Europe. Millions were homeless, entire towns and villages were destroyed, and even major cities suffered unthinkable damage. Take Warsaw. World War II historian Keith Lowe says that about 90% of the city had been destroyed, and it was like that across the landscape. Except for the German city of Konstanz, this little German town made it through the entire war without being bombed once, without being attacked, and essentially remained completely untouched. How? A bluff of epic proportions. Blackouts were the norm across Europe. At night, cities descended into darkness in an attempt to hide from enemy bombers. Konstanz simply kept all their lights on. Konstanz sits right along the German border with Switzerland, which was a neutral country. When they noticed that the nearby Swiss town of Koinslingen kept their lights on, confident that they weren't going to be targeted by either side, the whole town of Konstanz sort of collectively shrugged and said, we can do that too, actually. They did, and it totally worked. The ancient city was never attacked by Allied bombers who thought they must be Swiss because no German town would be crazy enough to keep the lights on. It's easy to assume that the American military was a well-oiled machine that was super prepared for the inevitable entry into World War II. The country had a ton of time to prepare after all, but that wasn't the case at all, as General George S. Patton very quickly learned. First, let's point out that Patton was among the era's ultra-rich. He had family ties to George Washington and English and Welsh nobility. It also didn't hurt that he married into a massive industrialist family. That meant that he had the personal wealth to outfit his own armored tank division, and he absolutely did, by ordering parts and supplies from the widely popular Sears Roebuck. At the time, Sears Roebuck was the country's largest retailer, and it's a good thing, too. When he was placed in command of the 2nd Armored Division, they didn't have anywhere near the gear they needed to head into battle, so Patton ordered everything from tools and replacement parts to wash basins from the mail order catalog and told them to send him the bill. He never revealed how much it all came to, but he financed it all himself. Bombing runs might usually have a target that needs to be destroyed, but on January 30th, 1943, Royal Air Force bombers headed out with another objective in mind. They wanted to get on the radio. The day was a significant one because there was a whole host of events planned to celebrate Hitler's 10 years in power. At the time, the German public still kind of thought that the Luftwaffe was going to protect them from serious Allied attacks from above. But the number 105 squadron proved just how incorrect that was by buzzing Hermann Goering as he gave a speech hailing his great Fuhrer. The British knew exactly when he was going to start his speech, and more importantly, they knew it was going to be broadcast across Germany. So they sent two aptly named de Havilland mosquitoes to buzz by Goering and the Nazi Broadcasting Company, providing background music for a speech. 
Audio techs cut the feed, but epically, they did the same thing to Joseph Goebbels a few hours later. One of the bombers was shot down as they headed for home, but the whole incident led Goering to rant, they have the geniuses and we have the nimcompoops. By the time Sir Adrian Carton de Viar headed out to the front lines of World War II, he had already plenty of experience under his belt. He'd served in the Boer War and World War I, and he'd suffered some insane injuries. In addition to losing his hand and left eye, he'd also been shot in pretty much every place someone can take a bullet, including the back of his head, groin, and ear. He was hurt and sent to the same hospital so many times that he kept a pair of PJs there for his inevitable return. And that's no joke. During World War II, he was stationed in a few different places before things got real, and he got sent to Yugoslavia as part of a diplomatic mission. A plane was shot down, and he was captured and sent to Italy's Vincigliata Castle. The fact that they were just 200 miles from the Swiss border was enough to make the now elderly DVR determined to escape, and he did, after he and his fellow prisoners dug a 60-foot escape tunnel through the castle's bedrock. He managed to stay on the run for eight days until he was recaptured. Released a few years later, he went on to become Churchill's representative in China until he retired and passed away peacefully in 1963. There are hundreds of monkeys living on Gibraltar. They become so accustomed to and unafraid of people that using the words massive pests to describe them wouldn't be incorrect. They're skilled pickpockets, and they so strongly identify shopping bags with food that locals keep their groceries in their cars. But why are they there? That's an interesting story. For centuries, there's been sort of an urban legend that's very similar to the one told about the ravens at the Tower of London. This one said that if Gibraltar ever found itself monkey-free, British rule there would end. By 1942, there were only a few monkeys left. With everything that was going on in the world, no one can really blame Churchill for not wanting to take the risk of there being some legit truth to the old tale. So he issued a top-secret order to repopulate the island with macaques. And they did. It was only in 2005 that NBC News reported the mystery of where exactly they had come from was solved. DNA testing on Gibraltar's current monkey residents revealed that they had been sourced from both native locations of Morocco and Algeria. And yes, they're thriving. The idea that Adolf Hitler had an anti-Nazi half-Irish nephew named Patty Hitler sounds insane, but it's absolutely true. And the more famous Hitler often called him his, quote, loathsome nephew. Patty was the son of Hitler's half-brother, Alois, who was working in a Dublin hotel when he met Bridget Dowling. They married, and William Patrick came along in 1911. Hey, everybody. My name is Willy Hitler. Adolf Hitler is my uncle. He's gonna hook me up. Although Patty spent some time living in Germany in the late 1930s, he and his half-uncle didn't exactly see eye to eye. He was working for Opel when, rumor has it, he threatened to come forward with the family's Jewish ancestry. When Uncle Adolf responded by insisting he become a German citizen, Patty decided it was time to get out of Dodge, or Berlin, as it were. By 1939, Patty and his mother were living in the U.S., and Patty didn't just write articles like, Why I Hate My Uncle. He also enlisted in the U.S. Navy and served in the war. Afterwards, they changed their name to Stuart Houston, which is admittedly better than going by either Patty Hitler or even Bill Hitler. Bridget died in 1969 and Patty in 1987, and Patty did continue the family line with three sons. They, however, reportedly made a pact to never have children and end the Hitler line. They kept that pact. Boom. Boom in your face, Hitler. Blackmailed might be kind of a strong term. What Doris Castle Ross did was to strongly suggest that if Winston Churchill didn't want her to go public with their affair, he'd take her back to Britain with him and make sure things went well. During World War II, Churchill was famously married to Clementine, who was often depicted as one half of a power couple. Rumors that he'd been having an affair were easy to discount. But in 2018, The Guardian reported that both photos and old interviews with his private secretaries had surfaced, confirming that yes, he had an affair with Lady Doris Castleross. It went on throughout the 1930s, and they headed off to France together for some time alone. It was during that time that he painted several portraits, and that, it turns out, was a mistake. Churchill technically ended the fling at the onset of World War II, but it predictably wasn't over just yet. After spending some time in the U.S., Castle Ross decided she wanted to go home, and Churchill was her ticket. When he went to the States for a 1942 meeting with Roosevelt, she showed up too, with paintings that proved her side of the story and ultimately got her a ticket home. The entire story was later corroborated by her sister-in-law, Caroline Delevingne. And yes, Churchill's lover was the great aunt of model and actress Cara Delevingne. Surely the Nazis weren't working on building a Death Star, were they? Actually, it was 1923 and a Nazi scientist named Hermann Oberth proposed building a massive mirror and launching it into Earth's orbit. 
The idea was that it could be controlled by a crew who lived on an attached space station, and it could be turned to focus on points on the Earth's surface. Imagine it like a giant magnifying glass, humankind as the ants, and Nazis as the bullies frying them on the sidewalk. News says that the plans were among the many, many documents that fell into Allied hands at the end of the war, and they were ultimately replicated and preserved in Life magazine. Ober didn't forget about it either. He survived the war and was pushing his idea for more peaceful applications well into the 1960s. He believed that it could be used to control weather patterns, terraform deserts, and concentrate the sun's energy for optimal use as a renewable energy source. Oberth also insisted that his project was much, much more practical than just trying to get to the moon, and space mirrors were what NASA really should be concentrating on. Jeffrey Pike was a bit of a unique individual. According to The Guardian, when he couldn't find a school that was good enough for his son, he turned his attention to first mastering the art of trading stocks to earn cash, then use that cash to found an acceptable school. It's not entirely surprising, then, that the same mind was the one who came up with one of the most bizarre plans for the British fleet. He was trying to come up with a way to combat the German U-boats and reasoned this. Icebergs were hard to sink, so why not make an aircraft carrier out of what was essentially a massive iceberg? Project Habakkuk was born. The original plan to use an actual iceberg towed down from the Arctic didn't work, so they came up with the idea to build a huge warship with an ice base and a heavy landing deck. The planned ship was 2,000 feet long and would be able to carry 300 planes. And here's where Canada comes in. R&D set up on Alberta's Lake Patricia, and while it looked promising at first, the plan didn't progress beyond the construction of a 60-foot-long prototype. Why? More effective aircraft and the development of radar made it obsolete before it was built. The entire thing was abandoned. The ice ultimately melted, but as of 2018, divers have confirmed that the more durable parts of the project were still there. This one's twofold. The Nazis, it turns out, were running two programs to try to create the perfect forces. One was headquartered at a long-lost stud farm in what is now Czechia, or as most people call it, the Czech Republic. In 1942, Nazi scouts started buying and moving purebred lipid xanners to the remote breeding facility where they were joined by hand-selected Arabians. The idea was to combine the two into a new breed, which would have incredible stamina and be energetic but manageable. Most importantly, it would be pure white. It was estimated that by inbreeding the small group of hand-picked stock, the breeds would be overhauled into one perfect Aryan horse in just three years. It actually did kind of work. By 1944, the stud farm was home to a herd of pure white horses. They were still there at the end of the war, and in 1946, Americans evacuated them ahead of the advancing Russian army. Some were returned to the States and the horse farm of W.K. Kellogg. Meanwhile, other Nazi scientists were trying to bring back another breed from extinction. Lutz Heck of the Berlin Zoo used animals like the Polish Konik pony to try to recreate extinct once wild tarpons through careful breeding. Many of these animals were slaughtered and eaten in the post-war chaos, but the descendants of these so-called heck horses are still around and can be seen living in small herds across Europe. Theresienstadt was unique among the thousands of concentration camps set up by the Nazis in that it served a few different purposes. In addition to being a way station where prisoners were sent before being shuffled off towards their oftentimes very final destination, it was also used for holding specific groups, including World War I veterans and the elderly. It was also the concentration camp the Germans showed other nations to assure them that, nope, there's nothing shady going on here at all. It really started in 1944, when Denmark wanted to know what was being done with all their Jews. Theresienstadt got a makeover, which included newly paved streets, a playground, and 1,200 rose bushes. Even as 7,500 people were transferred to Auschwitz to make it seem a little more like the happy little community they said it was, and not like the prison camp it actually was. They went all out, holding operas and concerts in public areas and outfitting shops with shiny new things that prisoners definitely weren't allowed to have. The Danish were so impressed by it that the Nazis decided to make a promotional film there. It was called The Fuhrer Gives a City to the Jews, and the inmate that filmed it was executed in Auschwitz not long after. Theresienstadt says the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum became known as a spa town and comfortable retirement community for Europe's elderly Jews. It was not. I must say, I sat there and didn't know whether it would be water or gas. It was water. In 2015, The Telegraph reported on the presentation of the Légion d'Honneur Medal to 3,000 soldiers who helped liberate France from Nazi occupation. Among them was the British Bob Roberts, who had an incredible story of cheating death on multiple occasions, including the time when a sniper shot just grazed his scalp instead of killing him instantly. 
Roberts was a diminutive figure. Standing just 5 foot 3 inches, he would have been exempt from service under earlier British Army regulations. And it's his height that made it particularly hilarious that he was sent to accept the surrender of the tallest man in the Nazi army. Yakov Nakin was listed often as either 7 foot 6 or 7 foot 3. In reality, he was probably 6 foot 11, but regardless, he towered over Roberts as he searched him and accepted the surrender. Roberts later remembered that, yes, everyone there had thought it was funny, saying, I didn't take a lot of notice of this guy at the time, but my mates, who were watching the rest of the men, saw this giant of a guy approach me, and I was aware they and the Germans were having a good laugh. The National Canine Defense League called it the September Holocaust, and they were talking about what was happening to Britain's once-beloved pets. It started with a 1939 pamphlet called Air Raid Precautions for Animals. In it, the Home Office recommended city dwellers send their pets to the country to keep them safe, but it included the unfortunate sentiment, if you cannot place them, it really is kindest to have them destroyed. And that's what people did on a shocking scale. An estimated 750,000 pets were killed in a single week in September, mostly by families concerned of rumors of food shortages. There was a widespread outcry from animal charities like the RSPCA, with newspapers running reminders like the one from the Daily Mirror. Putting your pets to sleep is a very tragic decision. Do not take it before it is absolutely necessary. Thousands more were abandoned and rescued. The four staff members of the Battersea Dogs and Cats home cared for a shocking 145,000 abandoned pets throughout the war years, while the Duchess of Hamilton founded her own sanctuary to save hundreds of others. Still, the push for euthanasia was so great that the crematoriums couldn't keep up. Bodies piled in the streets, and the NCDL donated some of their land for a mass grave, which was the final resting place of half a million beloved pets. The projected pet food shortage never happened, and pet food was never rationed. Were aliens occupying our skies during World War II? Were they secret Nazi superweapons? What was really behind the surge of UFO sightings of the 1940s and beyond? When most people hear the phrase Foo Fighters, they'll immediately think of the band led by rock legend Dave Grohl. The phrase, however, is a lot older than the band. It's actually an old word for UFOs dating back to World War II. One of the most prominent early UFO sightings happened during the latter years of World War II. According to the History Channel, in November 1944, three U.S. Air Force personnel saw unexplained lights up in the sky. They were on a night flight over the Rhine Valley in France when a series of 8 to 10 bright orange lights appeared over the hills. They mistook them for enemy fighters at first, but by the time they turned their plane to intercept them, the lights had vanished. Other pilots soon reported similar strange glowing lights, describing them as white, orange, red, or fiery. They could make seemingly impossible maneuvers in the sky before vanishing without a trace. One in particular mentioned red fireballs off his wingtips, which didn't leave until he dropped into a dive at 360 miles per hour. Seemingly, there were a variety of objects reported as Foo Fighters. Sightings included things like lights flying in formation and wingless cigar-shaped objects. Rather than moving at random, the lights seen by pilots appeared to be under perfect control at all times. With such a plethora of reports, it was only a matter of time before the term Foo Fighter made it into popular culture. The name Foo Fighter is purposefully silly sounding. Even Dave Grohl admits as much. Honestly, Foo Fighters is like the stupidest band name you've ever heard. <laughs> but it may have served a purpose in World War II. Trapped in such a deeply stressful situation, keeping a sense of humor was a coping mechanism for American military personnel during World War II. The choice of a comical name worked to take the edge off what were no doubt deeply unsettling experiences for air crews in the sky. After all, at the time, radar was still a new technology, and U.S. pilots had only been involved in nighttime operations for a few years. The night skies were still very much unfamiliar territory for American pilots, and the constant chance of seeing unexplained things while flying would be enough to unnerve even the most steadfast of pilots. The name itself most likely came from an American comic strip by the name of Smokey Stover. The nonsense word foo was used frequently in the comic, thrown in at random for the sake of absurdist comedy. The name could possibly have come from a 1938 book entitled simply The Foo Fighter. There were multiple Foo Fighter sightings in Europe, but they were also seen in other parts of the world during the Second World War, often reported by members of the military. One account is given in the book Bringing the Thunder, the missions of a World War II B-29 pilot in the Pacific. In it, a bomber pilot talks about a mission over Tokyo where several people witnessed an unidentified object. They described it as a large burning sphere hanging out there in the sky. The sphere appeared aerodynamically incapable of flight and didn't seem to have any means of propulsion, but it reportedly followed their planes before it was shot down. Minutes later, a second was seen also pursuing them and prompting the pilots to 
Lee. Similar fireballs were reported by crews on other missions, too, but when military intelligence heard about the mysterious fireballs, they had no explanation for what they could have been. While it was the U.S. Air Force who gave the UFOs the name of Foo Fighters, reports of strange phenomena in the skies had begun much earlier. After all, with World War II having begun in 1939, there had been plenty of airplanes in the skies over Europe for years. The UK's Royal Air Force had been sending out bomber crews regularly, and several of them had reported lights in the sky, glowing objects, and things that had been officially dubbed aeroflots. The reports from British pilots date back to March 1942, and there were numerous other reports worldwide in the early 1940s. Another incident was in the U.S. in 1942, when unidentified craft flew over Los Angeles, seemingly causing a blackout. Originally assumed to be Japanese aircraft, there was never any explanation for what the mysterious objects were. Seemingly, though, the majority of sightings were reported in 1944 over Europe. According to the book Smoke and Rockets, the sightings were so numerous that many Allied soldiers started assuming them to be German aircraft. Despite the concerns that these were enemy vehicles, though, the Foo Fighters were never reported to cause any damage to aircraft. Air crews began to consider them more of a nuisance than any actual threat, as they tended to simply follow airplanes. All the same, the pilots remained wary because the unknown objects were impossibly maneuverable, easily managing to evade entire squadrons of fighters. In the nerve-wracking grip of the ongoing war, there was no shortage of speculation that the German Luftwaffe may have been responsible for the Foo Fighters. Rumors began to simmer, and people seemingly had good reason for their suspicions. By this point, German engineers had invented the V-2 rocket, the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile. But the V-2 wasn't maneuverable enough to match what pilots had reported seeing in the skies over the Rhine Valley. It also seemed like quite a coincidence that, as the Sarasota Herald Tribune mentions, when Allied forces captured the East Rhine, sightings of Foo Fighters fighters in the area stopped. With all of this on their minds, people began to worry about some kind of German superweapon. The rumors began to spread so persistently that it was even reported by newspapers. However, as history can attest, this would later turn out not to be the case. In fact, the book Smoke and Rockets notes that unidentified objects had also been reported by both German and Japanese air crews. Interestingly enough, when you look at uh, the Luftwaffe, so the German Air Force, they were seeing them too. Whatever the strange objects were, seemingly they were a puzzle to pilots on both sides of the conflict. In September 1945, World War II came to an end, but the sightings of mysterious objects in the skies continued. It's uncertain whether they were related to the Foo Fighters seen by wartime pilots, but 1946 saw Scandinavia inundated with sightings of strange objects dubbed ghost rockets. At least one incident, per the New York Times, almost caused casualties as a ghost rocket crashed into a lake. They were believed to originate from somewhere near Germany, and fragments were reportedly recovered, but specific details remained elusive. The Swedish military investigated, finding that the rockets could fly as far as 800 miles, an unprecedented distance for a ballistic missile at the time with the German V-2 rockets having a maximum range of just 220 miles. They wouldn't release their files on the sightings until 40 years later, when it was revealed that Sweden had classified more than 1,500 ghost rocket reports. Over the following months, there was a spat of sightings of these ghost rockets. As the Deccan Chronicle mentions, they were even seen over the Finnish capital of Helsinki. One passed over the city, making a thunderous noise and leaving a trail of luminous smoke that hung in the air for around 10 minutes. Even as the ghost rockets over Scandinavia started to taper off around the end of 1940, Sightings of similar objects were reported further south in Hungary, Greece, Portugal, and Morocco. The Foo Fighters were well documented during wartime, but it wasn't until later that the term UFO would enter popular consciousness. The sighting which would kick off the cultural phenomenon of UFOs per the History Channel happened in 1947, but the event itself seems eerily similar to the reports of Foo Fighters. A businessman by the name of Kenneth Arnold was flying a private light aircraft near Mount Rainier in Washington when he reported seeing nine glowing objects in the sky. He described them as crescent-shaped and traveling at what he estimated to be several thousand miles per hour. A newspaper report would later mistakenly report these objects as being saucer-shaped, leading the flying saucer to become part of our vocabulary. The same year, the Roswell incident would capture the imagination of the world, with the U.S. military initially reporting that they'd recovered the wreckage of a flying disc. The objects seen by Arnold were reportedly flying in an echelon formation, much like the Foo Fighters reported by World War II pilots. The idea of flying saucers was put on a crash course with pop culture, starting in mid-20th century sci-fi movies like Earth vs. the Flying Saucers and Plan 9 from Outer Space, persisting until more recent fiction like The X-Files. Take a look for yourself. What in the world? That's nothing from this world. 
A declassified CIA report from 1953 discusses the Foo Fighters, making a point to note that if the term flying saucers had been popular in 1943 to 1945, these objects would have been so labeled. With so many UFOs being reported by air crews, the U.S. military began a serious investigation into possible causes. They had to consider the possibility that something might be affecting the perceptions of the people involved. Wartime had forced militaries to move quickly, meaning there were plenty of potential gaps in knowledge about the physical rigors to which Air Force members were being subjected. One thing military scientists investigated was aviators' vertigo. According to an article in Skeptic magazine, this is a feeling of disorientation caused by the motion of an aircraft, which can have a number of effects on a flight crew. Essentially, it covers any sensation or perception which doesn't match the objective reality of the environment. One effect of aviator's vertigo is the sensation known as autokinesis, an optical illusion that gives the impression that stationary objects are actually moving. The result is that points of light can appear to move. This study followed up an earlier idea that the Foo Fighters were hallucinations seen by air crews suffering from battle fatigue condition brought on by the stress of spending time in active war zones. Soldiers suffering from battle fatigue can experience hypersensitivity to light and movement, suggesting that it could combine with aviator's vertigo to give the illusion of moving lights in the sky. However, as Smithsonian Magazine notes, the crews themselves disagreed with this assessment. Simply, it didn't match what they'd experienced. There was a lot of speculation among scientists about what the Foo Fighters might actually have been, and one likely culprit was some kind of atmospheric phenomenon. Earth's atmosphere is home to a wide variety of optical effects, like reflections off of high-altitude ice crystals, which can cause light to play tricks on observers. Additionally, in 1945, Time reported that the Foo Fighters might have been St. Elmo's Fire, an optical effect where an electrical discharge can emit light. St. Elmo's Fire has been well known for a long time, often seen on the masts of ships out at sea. With the right weather conditions, it can also be seen on church steeples and aircraft. But as seasoned military pilots, many of those who reported seeing Foo Fighters were familiar with St. Elmo's Fire. St. Elmo's Fire? I don't think so. It's not moving the way it should. Another possibility, which seems like a better match, is ball lightning. This is a mysterious and poorly understood electrical phenomenon, usually seen during thunderstorms where a sphere of glowing light can appear in the air. Ball lightning can have varying colors, from blue to yellow to orange, and even now in the 21st century, little is known about it. However, this doesn't seem to fully explain the Foo Fighters reported by pilots either. Whatever they really were, the Foo Fighters were seemingly unlike anything else seen before. Unfortunately, eyewitness accounts were essentially all investigators had to go on. None were ever confirmed by radar either, though granted, radar was still a new technology at the time, being first used to detect aircraft in 1938. All kinds of explanations have been explored, but nothing has ever been able to adequately explain what the Foo Fighters were. They remain a mystery to this day, and maybe they always will be.